Hi there, it's Alexandra from the Middle Size Garden YouTube channel and blog and today we're talking about making your garden more wildlife friendly or generally just more of a wild garden and it's a more relaxed way of gardening. So I'm talking to award-winning garden designer Fern Alder whose garden has been featured in Gardens Illustrated, the UK magazine. And the photographer, Sarah Cuttle, said, this is the gardening of the future. It's sustainable, it's all about the wildlife and plants, and it's a complete joy to be in. If you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads free videos every Saturday with tips, ideas, and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see these videos when you open up YouTube, click on subscribe. And if you'd like YouTube to notify you when new videos are published, then click on the notifications bell. Fern says that one of the most important things you can do in your garden is just to watch. A lot of us have been very much more restricted than we have been in the past, so actually just watching your garden is incredibly good just to calm yourself down, but also to see what's working and what isn't. Fern's really enjoyed seeing a wren scuttle along underneath the, her windowsill looking for cobwebs and spiders, which wrens adore, and also watching birds queue up to use the bird bath. And Fern says, if there's just one thing that you can do for wildlife in your garden this winter, and that's provide water. She's got a stream in her garden, but she also has a mini pond and a bird bath. And the important thing to remember when you're putting mini ponds and bird baths in is that you need a number of levels because very, very small creatures like insects um, can drown in deep water. And also if something like a hedgehog was to fall into a mini pond and not be able to get out, if it's very straight sided, for example, that also would be a tragedy. I have got a mini pond made out of an oak barrel and I've got a video on how to do that, which I'll put in the description below but it is quite high sided. So I've built it up inside. I've got some aquatic plants in there. I've got a sort of saucer of shallower area and I've made sure that any little animal that falls in can also get out. There are problems with standing water in some countries which are very mosquito prone, but two of the ways you can deal with that is to have some kind of a pump to keep the water moving or to have fish which will eat the larvae. But there's also often regulations and advice where you live. Fern's garden is a long thin town garden but it has an unusual quality in that it ends in a bit of protected woodland. She's really based it around plants, there's a path that goes down the middle and otherwise it's mainly planting. And she's also minimised the use of chemicals and she says that this is one thing that you can also really do to help wildlife now. I've interviewed a number of top head gardeners this year and they're running professional gardens often open 365 days a year so they do have to look good and I've been really interested to hear how so many top gardeners are using fewer chemicals these days. For example I spoke to Neil Miller who's the head gardener at Hever Castle Gardens and he said that in early summer the roses are just thick with aphids but they don't do anything they just let it be. And within two or three weeks, the aphids are all gone because the predators have built up, which is the birds and the ladybirds. And just after I talked to him, I noticed one of my dahlias was thick with aphids, but I just left it. And two or three weeks later, I went back and there were no aphids left. And in fact, it's this dahlia here. And as you can see, it's really healthy. It's quite a mainstream thing now is to minimise the use of chemicals and the Royal Horticultural Society even suggests that, for instance, if you've got ants' nests in your lawn, that if they're unsightly, you should just spray them with a hose. Um, but otherwise, if you've got things like ants or even viburnum beetle or black spot, they're not actually going to harm the plants. So it may be better to just leave them be. Insects are at the bottom end of our food chain and we're at the top end, so it is really in our interests to protect the insects and to make sure that not too many of them are got rid of unnecessarily. One thing that Fern says is that healthy plants don't get pests and diseases or you don't notice pests and diseases as much on healthy, happy plants as you do on plants that are struggling. So if you can plant your plants in the right place for them, and uh, give them, feed the soil and give them everything they need. A happy plant, it may get a bit nibbled by some slugs, but actually you probably won't notice it. Whereas if you've got a plant that maybe is planted in a place that's too shady for it and it's struggling, and it's already beginning to look a bit sad, then when a slug comes along and starts to nibble its leaves, you know, you really will have quite an unsightly plant. 
Soil is an incredibly important part of a wildlife friendly garden. And Fern has told me that in just one teaspoon of soil, there are more living organisms than there are human beings on the planet at the moment. And that's something you can confirm on the website of the United States Department of Agriculture. And all these microorganisms, they include things like fungi, like insects that you can't see, insects you can see, like beetles and ants. They include nematodes and bacteria and all manner of things. But all of these, of course, need feeding. And that's why putting well-rotted manure or garden compost on your soil to feed the microorganisms is so good for your soil. And they have a structure to their lives and digging destroys this structure. And so because our land is now covered over with buildings and roads, or it's very intensively farmed, the soil structure around the world is getting very badly damaged, and that will affect our ability to grow food. The United States Department of Agriculture said often the healthiest soil is to be found on the edge of the farmland, where it hasn't been tilled. And they say that one of the things that you can do to make your soil healthier is to see as little of it as possible by which they mean cover it up with plants and don't dig it unless you really have to. Charles Dowding has got a YouTube channel all about no dig and we did a video together which I'll put in the description below about no dig for flowers but you can get lots more about no dig on his channel. And the other thing to remember about soil is that it's like a sponge. When it rains the soil soaks up the water and it holds it there and it slowly releases it to plants and things like that. But if you cover your soil with tarmac and concrete and everything, then the soil doesn't act as a sponge. The water runs off, it goes into our drainage systems and that's how you get flash flooding. So looking after your soil is a really important part of looking after wildlife, having a wild garden and actually having a garden that's just much easier to look after. Fern says it's just really important not to be too tidy in the garden. Leave piles of leaves around. Of course, leaves on the lawn will actually choke the grass and leaves on a path can be a slip hazard. But just brush the leaves off the path and into a border or into a corner where they'll provide shelter for microorganisms and where then the birds will dig around and find a little bit of a tasty snack. Shelter is another thing that's very important for wildlife obviously particularly in the winter. And one of the main things you can do is plant evergreen plants. Fern says you don't have to spend money on bat boxes and insect hotels and bird boxes, although she has some and I do too, and actually they can look really nice. But if you just leave piles of leaves in corners, perhaps on beds, and if you're trimming your trees this winter, just leave a few of the branches tucked away in a corner. All of that will make a lovely habitat. Fern's garden goes down into some woodland and she's had to clear it from time to time just to maintain it. But she's left the tree stumps there and some of the logs and also she's cut some of the logs to make a log bench to sit on. And the last part of your garden that is so important for wildlife is flowers. If you can have flowers in your garden all year round you will benefit wildlife hugely and you will have a beautiful garden. Which flowers you can actually have in your garden at winter depend on where you live. So, you know, just look at your neighbours' gardens and the parks and what's growing around you. And often you'll find a surprisingly wide range of flowers. Here we would call ourselves a USDA zone of hardiness of eight or nine, which means that our winters are quite mild. We rarely go below minus five Celsius, 23 Fahrenheit. But many of the plants that flower in our winter also do well in much colder areas. This viburnum, for example, flowers for me all winter. Ivy is a fantastic plant because it flowers in the winter and Fern has a fatsia on her terrace and she says that's a member of the ivy family, that's providing pollen and food and something for the birds. And ivy is generally very good. People worry it's a bit invasive, but you can keep it under control. And it provides evergreen shelter. It's somewhere for birds to nest. And it has flowers and berries in winter. Ferns planted a few fruit trees, which obviously give spring blossom in the spring, which is great for pollinators, and fruit in the autumn, which she sometimes eats and she sometimes leaves for the birds. A very good flower in winter here in the UK is Mahonia and if you don't like the spiky Mahonias then there's a new softer version called Mahonia Soft Caress seen here at Grave Time Anna Gardens. Flowers that flower in winter are often very fragrant. Think about witch hazel and sweet box.
Also, you can have flowers in your window boxes or pots. Cyclamen, for example, are very good for bees. Although, however, winter pansies, which are sold as bedding material, aren't so good because the bees, they don't have much nectar and the bees can't actually get into the heart because they're double flowered. Most plants now do have how bee friendly they are on the label, so do check. Although Fern gets a lot of her flowers at local plant swaps. And that's something, if you don't want to spend too much money on plants, then either find local plant swaps or even set one up yourself. And as winter goes on, there'll be snowdrops, pulmonaria, anemones, bergenia, hellebores and primroses. So there are lots of things for us to enjoy and also for wildlife to enjoy. We all want different things from our gardens, but a wildlife friendly garden is often very low maintenance. And it helps you get away from this endless list of things to do because so many of the things you don't actually have to do them or it doesn't matter if you do them a little bit late. And if you're interested in wildlife friendly gardening, there's a playlist at the end of this video with more wildlife and eco tips. And if you've enjoyed this, please do hit like because that helps me know that you'd like to hear more about wild gardens. And if you'd like more tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden, then do subscribe to The Middle Sized Garden and thank you for watching. Goodbye.